over to the carpet I go. Um, uh, the woman that you see over here in the picture, which is a bit uh, dark, I'm, uh, I'm afraid, but um, is my wife, who's also sitting here in the audience. I'm, uh, well, I do, a, I wear a couple of hats. The first one is that I'm a professor of political science at the Lahore University of Management Sciences. Uh, I authored this, authored this book called The Class Structure of Pakistan. Uh, which also won the Akhtar uh, Hamid Khan Award for Best Book of Social Sciences of 2012, in which I looked at the class structure of Pakistan. I also have a, a television series called The History of Philosophy in Urdu, which covers everything from the Greeks all the way to the 14th century. And hopefully, in this coming year, I'll make the second part of that series, which will cover everything from the Renaissance to the modern age. And, uh, but aside from my academic careers, uh, I am also a musician, and uh, I was inspired by uh, musicians who use their art for social change. And when I look back into history, we see that there's a rich tradition of that. In fact, Plato, uh, the great philosopher, thought that any musical innovation is full of danger for the state and ought to be prohibited. When modes of music, music change, the fun fundamental laws of the state always change with them. So that's how subversive he thought music could arguably be. By the way, he wasn't trying to subvert the state when he said this. He was trying to, in fact, keep the, uh, consolidate the state. But also a beautiful phrase by Leo Tolstoy, who says, universal art illustrates that people are already united in the oneness of life's joys and sorrows. And to me, that really comes true with music, that it unites us, it brings us together. And that's what I wanted to do with my music. Now, music has a long and uh, incredible history uh, with the, in its relation to social change. When you think of music today, you think of, the, of what's on your TV screen, which is music utilized only for one particular purpose. And that the purpose there is, of course, either to advertise a film or to sell a product or to just say, you, let's have a good time. It's used purely for entertainment. But that's not always been the purpose of music, although, of course, music always entertains. It never fails to do that. But from the Renaissance to Bob Marley, it has inspired social change. It has, uh, you know, slogans become songs, songs become slogans. This has been the history of the music of resistance. And we see that also in our own culture, in our own history. You can look at the Sufi poetry and how it, it's such a vital part of our culture and heritage. You can look at the traditions of Urdu poetry, in particular progressive uh, literature and poetry, which was mentioned as the theme of today's TED Talks, Fez Ahmed Fez, but also Habib Jaleb, and also Ahmed Faraz, and so on. And then you can also examine folk in classical music. You see, uh, my understanding is that culture reflects the emotional, the collective emotional intelligence of a civilization. We talk about the intelligence quotient, we talk about, you know, technical intelligence, you are all here engineers and various other forms of scientists. But culture and the art is as important to society as building roads and bridges and developing information technology. Because it is the repository of our um, emotional intelligence, of our collective emotional intelligence. How do you know how to approach someone, how to talk to someone, how to speak to someone? That is all part of our culture and that we get through our music, through our poetry, and through our literature, through our art, and so on. Uh, in South Asia, we can see the, how the poetry and music of resistance has been, uh, we can see it in the context of the Bhakti movement, the Sufi movement, progressive music in Pakistan, Iqbal Bano singing fairs, and Nayira Noor singing fairs, and so on. And most importantly, music connects to the young, to, to, some, to, to, to people who really want to change the world. Let me put a little bit of context on what I was trying to do, how I grew up listening to music, and what I wanted to do with, with music in the future. How did popular music develop in Pakistan? Now, you saw an example, a brilliant example of classical music just before me. But what I was principally interested in was not classical music as I was growing up, but popular music. There's a joke that's often made, and I think it's, it's somewhat true. A rock musician plays three chords to 3,000 people. A classical musician plays 3,000 chords to three people. <laughs> the level of skill of a musician is not necessarily comparable to their popularity. Um, 
No, okay, so how did this all begin, this love that I had for music and that I wanted to use? Well, it began with this little device called a cassette. In the 1980s, suddenly Pakistan, uh, you know, in Pakistan we could get cassettes. We listened to Madonna. We listened to Michael Jackson. Yes, we did. I accept it. I admit it. You know, although I wouldn't uh, probably listen to, certainly not Madonna anymore, but... Uh, uh, and Michael Jackson was actually quite a phenomenal musician, no doubt about that. And you know, many of uh, many many popular musicians in Pakistan began to copy their tunes. And it was only decades later when YouTube came around that we discovered how many of the tunes that we grew up listening to were actually just copies of tunes in the West. Now, here's the interesting thing: the cassette revolution is said to have sparked the Iranian revolution. Because, you know, Ayatollah Khomeini used to record all his sermons on cassettes and smuggle them into Iran. But in Pakistan, it created a very different kind of revolution. And that was what led by Ghazi and Zuhair. Because everybody was listening to Disco Divane and Aap Jaisa Koi Meri Zindagi Me Aai. And they were doing it basically on these EMI cassettes that were widely available, that had just become widely available in Pakistan in the 1980s. But also there was a different kind of music going through this cassette revolution. And that was progressive music. Uh, I remember coming in contact with Fez Emmett Fez, first and foremost, thanks to Nayira Noor, whose album Nayira Sings Fez really introduced to me Fez's voice. I don't think I would have gotten, I would have fallen in love with Fez were it not, was it not for this particular album. And then there's, of course, Tina Sani, Bol Ki La and so on. And then Shwaya Mansoor got this brilliant idea. He said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to repackage Pakistani popular music, because let's remember this was a period, this was a conservative period in Pakistan's history, this was a period of military dictatorship, you had the al uh, who had a whole program of Islamization. But Trey Mansoor decided that just as Nazia had made popular, you know, had made disco music very popular, he was going to take pop music and he was going to repackage it in a way in which uh, he could sell it as being patriotic and he could talk about music contributing to, uh, to our, you know, uh, 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 to our spirit of nationalism. And so enter a vital sign with Dil Dil Pakistan, which became a massive hit. And very soon, now we may talk about the commercialization that occurred with Book Studio, but actually, you know, it was, it, it starts right from there, from the 1980s. And Pepsi was in on it in a huge way. Coca-Cola was sunking in a corner. Today's the other way around. Uh, so uh, it was Pepsi that really, you know, started, started pushing this uh, new kind of music that entered Pakistan's, uh, 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 you know, imagination. And corporations were brought on board. I remember it was like that when uh, an album used to come out, musicians would say, okay, I'll make an album. There'll be 10 songs on the album, nine of which will be about love, and one of which will be about love for your country. And the corporations would say, that's perfect. Okay, you go. Here's the money. We're going to sponsor your album. So that was the formula back then. Uh, but you know, our imagination really, I think, exploded with this amazing man, Nusrat Fazli Ali. And he had been singing for decades before, and you know, I think my generation truly discovered him, and he became an international icon. And it was—it's a funny thing that uh, that we Pakistanis have. It's that our cities. You know, Kelly is sort of sitting in our, he, he's, he's in our country, we say, you know, When Nusrat Fazili collaborated with Peter Gabriel and Michael Brook in 1988, that was when Sufi music and Kavali in particular just exploded in everyone's imagination, not just in Pakistan, but around the world, especially for me. And the other major influence was Salman uh, Ahmed. Uh, now, I don't always agree with everything he says, but when he wrote this, uh, you know, when he picked up his guitar and he wrote this instrumental piece called Heel, have you heard it? Okay, great. When he wrote that particular track, that was the first time that we heard a guitar playing a semi-classical Eastern tune. We could never imagine that a guitar could actually play something that would sound so Eastern, sounded so beautiful, so wonderful. And so I grew up with these influences, and then along came fusion that, I don't know why they got the spelling wrong. Uh, somebody ought to have given them a dictionary, but nonetheless, that's how things are today. 
Uh, that's not me getting the spelling wrong. I just want to clarify. Uh, you know, when they combine classical vocals with uh, with rock music and popular music, I think they really started what we consider, you know, what became uh, Coke Studio today. Because the central idea of Coke Studio, of course, is that they're playing folk music uh, and semi-classical music, but they're playing it on Western instruments, but they're playing Eastern melodies, etc. So I think really Fusion deserves credit for having done that. And Ruhel Deyat took that idea up, maybe not directly because it was in the air. He took it up and he really pushed forward the way in which Pakistani music was being heard, was being recorded, and, you know, uh, and he took it you know, uh, from rock to ragas, etc. explored all of that. That's quite a genius thing. Now we're reaching a sort of impasse in the story. Because many with the, uh, how many seasons of Coke Studio did we have now? Eight? Ten? Oh my god, after ten years, uh, we've begun to feel, I think, now that there's been what we call the McDonaldization uh, uh, effect on uh, Coke Studios music, which is, yeah. you have a nice product, it's a good burger, you make the same burger again and again and again for ten years. It gets a little stale sometimes, right? So have we reached the end of this wonderful creative journey that Nazia Hassan began uh, that involved progressive music with uh, Naya Noor, Salman Ahmed, Fusion, uh, Nusrat Patel Khan, etc., etc. Have we reached the end? I don't know. Maybe not. Here, we, here I come. I will fix myself now. A bit, a bit of self-promotion here, Clayton. But it doesn't matter. In 2006 began the Lawyers Movement, and I wrote a track which in fact I originally composed when I was about your age, which was called Umi De Saar, and we came up with an album. And we dedicated this album to the restoration of democracy in Pakistan. We worked with the lawyers' movement, the restoration of the judiciary. And we tried to introduce the idea that one could make good music, popular music, that would also uh, carry a social message. At first, the news channel said to me, and the promoter said to me, this will work in a niche market. Maybe you'll do a nice, nice TEDx talk at Must or whatever. But, <laughs> but it's never going to take off as popular music because the lyrics are too hard. And for God's sakes, who's not singing about love? And if you're not singing about love, nobody's really interested. Well, it turns out that wasn't really true. We turned out two albums and another 11 uh, singles. And today we have actually 1.25 million likes on Facebook. <laughs> and then we took on a number of campaigns, uh, not just the lawyers' movement, but we were already campaigning for earthquake relief in 2005. We raised a lot of money. Uh, then we went into the lawyers' movement in 2006. We worked to raise money for internally displaced people in 2009. We worked for flood relief again in 2010, and then we worked for land rights, uh, uh, Ukraine, Hanewal, etc. in 2010. We worked for uh, a justice for Shah Zain, uh, who was shot by uh, Shah Rukh Jutoi, who's actually just come out of imprisonment now again. Uh, and of course, our biggest campaign is our campaign against religious extremism in Pakistan, or rather, let's call it violent extremism in Pakistan, which started in 2012 and is continuing today. Uh, I've gotten into trouble, you know, when you're trying to change the world, you get into trouble. So my page was banned uh, one time and uh, Express carried the the, uh, the headline, love, don't express yourself, etc. But that happens, New York Times covered it, etc. And from that point onwards, we went from being called love band to being called love band. <laughs> And uh, uh, then we've had a couple of people who, uh, uh, you know, helped us with promotion, like Ahmed Qureshi, who, who thought that, you know, we were sort of, uh, people are forgetting about Lal, so he should say something controversial about us, so that we get back in the line. Like, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, although the things he did say, I didn't quite really agree with, so I had to take him to court, and I did, and he lost. Uh, so, um, you know, um, justice does sometimes prevail. Right, so I want to just uh, end by talking about our campaign, which is called Music for Peace. And the idea here has been that we are going to fight, yes, we are going to fight religious extremism, but we're not going to pick up the gun to do it. We're going to use our art to do it. We're going to use our voices to do it. 
So we use our instruments to do it. Thank you. Many people, you know, mistakenly think that if this is the job of the army, this is the job of the state, this is the job of the police or the courts, etc. But you know, the way in which religious extremism has impacted Pakistan, it's impacted every single citizen. It's changed the way we live our lives. It's changed our mohallas. It's changed our schools. It's changed our universities. It's changed the entire security scenario. It's changed our industry. It's changed our psychology, our mindset. I believe that this is a struggle that, it, that is not just our own state. It's a struggle for every individual, wherever you may be, and whatever profession you may be in. And so I launched this campaign and I started visiting private and public schools. I had no funding for it. I just started doing this. I picked up my acoustic guitar and started going to schools and, and so on. At first, I had no funding for it. Uh, and now, in the last 18 months, uh, I have visited 171 schools all across Pakistan, schools and universities and colleges all across Pakistan. It's a form for them for free. I in Punjab, in Sindh, in Punjab, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, and most of these schools have been in rural areas, and all of these schools have been middle class or working class schools that have never seen performances, musical performances, ever before. And let me tell you, uh, we've reached about 50,000 people, increased our Facebook presence to 1.25 million people. And I have rediscovered Pakistan in a way I could never have imagined. Now, Che Guevara, the great Argentinian revolutionary, wrote a really famous diary called the Motorcycle Diary, before he became revolutionary, in which he traveled on a motorcycle all across Latin America. Now, I didn't have a motorbike, but I have traveled all across Pakistan. And I have discovered my own people in a way, I've connected with my own people in a way I would not have been able to were it not for this campaign and this opportunity. And let me tell you, they are, they have hearts that are absolutely massive. They embrace you wherever they go. They are lovers of art, they are lovers of music, and they are lovers of peaceful and prosperous Pakistan. And each individual concert is great and short for a, a small event for the media to cover. But if somebody were to travel with me, they would, be, they would understand that the people of Pakistan are not extremists in their views or narrow-minded people. They are discovering me. So I end with this final thought. And the thought is, people ask me, they will, can music change society? Can music bring about political, social change? Can art do that? And I answer with this thing always. It's not a question of whether art can do it or music can do it. It's a question of whether you can do it. Are you ready? Give the time, give the energy.